we can make a choice for human rights or not. In fact, it's why we can make a choice to be on what I consider to be one side or the other, or the way we decide to lead our lives. Um, since I was a child, I, I, I could observe that somehow society is divided. And whatever I was taught, including at university, is divided into two areas. One is social, the other one is, uh, is profit. And, uh, and, and, and there is this tension. There is this tension we find it at, in, any, in any forms uh, of, of learning, in any form of uh, exposure that we have. But at a certain point, there are, there are things that happen to you and, uh, and possibly sensibility. And everyone has got its own journey to decide to, to take something there rather than something else, to, take a, to give a certain meaning to, to life as compared to something else. Very often this is uh, due to personal uh, experiences. Uh, in my case, I, I uh, had a loss in my family and it was uh, my knees. And then my second uh, nephew, he also had a uh, problem and he had to be rushed to a hospital for surgery. He was able to be treated in, uh, you know, with, uh, with all the, what the technology could offer at the time in the medical science. And he's alive now, he's, uh, you know, he's a happy father of three kids himself. But as I was in this hospital and, uh, you know, and I, was, uh, I was really worried for him because I'd already lost my knees. I was looking around me and looking at my, ch my nephew and saying, he's got a chance, he's going to make it. But then your mind goes to all the children who do not have this thing. And then, and then you start asking yourself, why is it that some of us have you know, opportunities and other people don't? And I, and I think out of this, uh, this sense of inequality, out of this sense of unfairness, because that's, that's about it, it is unfairness. It's not fair that you're born in a certain place, you're born with a certain family, loving family, as compared to an abusive family. Uh, you're born in a rich country as compared to a, to a poor country. You're born in a, in, in a free environment as compared to a, in an oppressive environment. And that determines your life. As I was wondering what I would do with my life and I was considering uh, that perhaps I should completely change my trajectory. At a certain point, uh, I, I, I had a thinking, and, and thinking hard is what is that I like about law? And what I like about law is, again, the general principles. I like some parts of the philosophy of law. I liked constitutional and public law because it's public. It belongs to everyone as compared to private, where I see that there is more this sense of, uh, of exclusion and privilege entrenched in, um, in the law at times, and I liked international law. International human rights law fascinated me because everything is, is about us, is about the individual, is about the person who has not. Uh, it, is, it is about making us believe that we can be equal. It's about ethics. It's about, as uh, to paraphrase, about to use or be inspired by former Deputy Secretary General Eliasson, is about the world as it should be. And that's what the United Nations are all about. Working for human rights is not easy. It's not always easy because we face many frustrations. But in the, in the meantime, we are driven by, by the conviction we're doing something helpful that hopefully is going to be helpful to, uh, to other people. Uh, I, I began being associated with uh, non-governmental organizations. And, uh, and I was based in Hong Kong, which at the time was still a colony. Um, and, and it was a regional organization that gave me the opportunity to travel, to, uh, to, do, to, uh, to live in solidarity because with, uh, with people who were really excluded from society, whether it is India, whether it is Africa, whether it is Western countries, because you have the same thing here, that people really live at the margin of society. We walk around misery and we don't see it. We walk around exploitation. We don't see it. Living in Geneva, you, you seem to live in a place which is a, very, it's a beautiful place. It's got everything for everybody, you think. And then COVID comes. And then I take my kids for a walk along the, uh, the river, the Arve. And there, there was a food distribution point. And here is this long queue, more than a kilometer long, of people queuing up for food here in Geneva, which is one of the richest places on earth. 
people are queuing up for food, and those were not the people you would expect, were not the, the, the people you expect to sleep in the streets, were family with kids. They were elderly couples. I mean, they're people who are not taken care of even in these societies. This is what human rights is all about. Then, human rights is also something else. Human rights is trying to fight against violence, is trying to fight against unnecessary killings, uh, is, is to fight against societal crisis, is to fight against systems. After serving in, uh, in Hong Kong, I had the opportunity, I, I went back to Italy, and that was before, still before joining the United Nations. And I joined the Italian, um, um, the Italian sector uh, of the uh, international campaign against landmines. That, that was a very extractive experience because there was one lesson that I learned, but also because we were just working on something that made so much sense, landmines. Why do we use landmines? In terms of military uh, use, there is a use, but the consequences of, uh, of, um, of, putting, of planting landmines were so obvious. In 1992, when Cambodia, at a certain point, uh, was uh, occupied by the United Nations with a, with a peace operation, it became obvious to everyone that the previous conflict had disseminated landmines, and those landmines were floating every time there was a flood in a country which being in the in, um, Mekong Delta is very often flooded and then moving. So every time there were so many children, uh, workers, uh, women, men, elderly, that had their limbs amputated because of the stepping on landmines months and years after those had been planted, that you really wonder whether you could make a military argument for the use of this. What I learned from the campaign was that, one, is, is that to bring something home, you need to have a very clear, simple message. And that is the reason why that, that campaign really made a difference. Because landmines kill are indiscriminatory, and the simple message was, do away with landmines. There was success. I mean, for once, we in Italy felt that there had been a contribution. Italy had been a big, Contributor to the, I mean, big producer of landmines and, and changed its production uh, at the time. Uh, the, the, the campaign won the Nobel Prize, which I think was, was, I feel very proud in a sense of having been associated to that. That provided me with a sense that something that you think is too big, first of all, can be undone, and also there can be recognition for it. For us in human rights, when we look at conflict, in addition to the big picture, we look at people. I, I've been out in, uh, in many places. Again, my career started in 1994. Uh, in I arrived in early September 1994 in Rwanda, a country that had been devastated by a, uh, still, in my opinion, underreported and underrecognized uh, genocide. Because what that genocide proved is that, is that only everyone can become a killer. That's what I saw in, um, in Rwanda. And I want to use this to explain another concept. Because what had happened in Rwanda, this 800,000 plus people, they, nobody will never know the exact amount of people have been killed by their neighbors. People were there together uh, and you know, possibly celebrating and talking to one another. Out of intoxication, all of a sudden, something went wrong in people's mind and they started killing one another. There was no place. I was in what was called Sector Five, um, in the in the northwest of um, of, uh, of Rwanda, and there was no uh, septic tank. You know, the villages had houses with septic tanks because the way it works and the toilets are. Uh, I, you know, I just, uh, I, I, we, there, there is no sewage system to have here. Every sympathy tank had a, uh, a corpse inside. This is what, what genocide was all about. It's something that you cannot see, you cannot understand unless you've been there. So I, I, I think that what we need to, uh, to retain from these lessons, from the lessons learned in, uh, in the period when I worked in former Yugoslavia, where again, neighbors were turned into enemies and killers, you know, the sniper, that was on the roof who was the friend, uh, you know, the, or the colleague just a couple of years before. There is something that can go wrong in human minds. But there is, here again, we cannot be prescriptive because there is another thing. We sometimes equate human rights and accountability 
with good people and bad people. It is never just as simple as that. If we talk about working in conflict uh, situations, um, we see that uh, we see that there is a centrality of action for the United Nations that, uh, for the time being, has not been replaced by for anyone else, within which human rights has got a uh, you know a, a significant role to play. Uh, intervening in conflict very often has been equated, and things are changing, but has been equated with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. The United Nations started getting involved in conflict in the early 60s, really at the beginning of, it, of, uh, of the existence of the organization had grown over the years. And in the 90s, uh, in particular, and the, in the early year 2000, there's been this explosion of peace operations. Initially, the idea was to interpose forces to stop conflicts, to create truces and uh, allow uh, peace being discussed and therefore uh, find peaceful solutions to conflict. There has been an evolution and at a certain point, uh, missions became more, uh, became bigger and they started integrating more and more uh, human rights. I've had the opportunity to serve in a, in a couple of peace operations, including as uh, chief human rights, and I've seen how human rights is central to, uh, to addressing conflict and, uh, and to conflict resolution. And within this, what is extremely important is to try to understand what happens. When there is a conflict, there is all of a sudden a complete loss of, uh, of confidence uh, in between uh, the people and, and authorities, in between people and the fighting uh, elements. And that, and, that is, uh, and that is something that the United Nations needs to be very attentive to. Working for human rights is, uh, is an issue that, contrary to what a, a quick reading uh, of uh, human rights work could suggest, is all about competence building. Being able to monitor what happens on the ground, being able to be foot on the ground and talking to people and understanding what their fears are, understanding what is happening, understanding and reporting what the abuses are, give an opportunity to authorities and when authorities have failed to the uh, peace operation to step and respond to what are the rightful demands of people. What human rights have got to offer in any given situation, but particularly in conflict situation, is that we talk to people. Uh, I, I, people are our constituency. The old concept of uh, protection of civilians at war is a byproduct, if you wish, of our work on human rights. Because uh, thanks to the work that has been done over the years, there was this recognition that contrary to what uh, the international humanitarian law prescribes, very often the principle of proportionality is completely neglected. And the people who are going to, uh, to suffer are the, um, you know, are the villagers, are the people who are caught in between crossfire. So um, the work we do in, uh, in terms of early warning, very often it is a very early stage. And what we do through what we call the emergency response teams is start to integrate in the thinking and the planning of the United Nations so on the ground elements that will allow to uh, address um, whether it is economic, social exclusion, cultural exclusion, or sometimes political exclusion uh, issues that, uh, that are not particularly uh, at the forefront. We had uh, a situation which, uh, which I would really consider as one, one of the success stories in terms of prevention, and that is uh, Nepal. Uh, back in 2005, we had done risk analysis. We had, a, we had a senior human rights advisor on the ground, and we saw that uh, there was the, the, the tail end of a monarchy. I was in the very early stage uh, involved in, that, in setting up that particular operation and conceptualizing it. And the fact that we were able to have people in a country that was ready to have that sort of intervention. We had colleagues that participated in, uh, in the many demonstrations that were happening, talking to the law enforcement officers, talking to the organizers, talking to the demonstrators, being very visible on the ground. Avoided, uh, in my opinion, and I think possibly in uh, in everyone's opinion, you know that those demonstrations could be suppressed uh, in blood because it could have happened. Nothing is perfect, uh, 
But it could be seen that an early intervention of an external actors, in this case, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, could contribute to peace. During conflict, very often people uh, go missing. They are underreported, uh, and, and, and never, no one knows exactly what has happened to them. Uh, the families of the missing, however, uh, continue to, to look for them. There is the history of the, uh, you know, the uh, Las Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, um, you know, the, the struggle in Latin America to figure out what had happened to the, to the missing, what happened to the children that were taken uh, uh, forcibly away from families and, uh, and given into adoption. This, in my experience, happens not just in Latin America. Some people think it's cultural, but it is not cultural. It happens in any given society. You know, it's a little bit saying what I heard sometimes people say, and this is so ridiculous. Some, once I heard someone say, an African mother suffers less because the likelihood of losing her child is so much higher. Can anyone be so dumb and believe that we human beings have different feelings? So the issue uh, of the missing is something that I've had to deal with in any given society. And it was very unfortunate that whereas for me, Yugoslavia had received so much uh, effort and attention to identify the missing person, the same effort didn't go uh, into what had happened in Rwanda. Or uh, I was working in Afghanistan, and you know, when, when at, in, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, people were demanding to know what had happened to them. And then there was the huge national lawyer jig, and unfortunately, the warlords were, were readmitted because otherwise the pathway that the Afghans that the, I'd been talking to had planned for themselves so was the one of national reconciliation through acknowledgement of the people who had gone missing. Giving them a name, and unfortunately what we see more and more now recently, is that we give statistics. These are X number of people being killed, but we don't say who these people are. Human rights is about the right to know. The families have the right to know what happened to them. Apart from that, there are also many other issues that, you know, that, uh, that are offsprings of uh, the non-recognition that the people have gone missing. People sometimes forget that depending on the legal framework within which you operate, you may lose entitlements uh, because you know, sometimes there is no uh, um, the, the, the presumption of death that is recognized at the national level. Women cannot remarry. Uh, inheritance rights are, are withheld. Uh, tenancy rights are withheld. But particularly, people have got the right to know what happened. We all need uh, role models. Uh, we all need heroes. Now, some of the heroes uh, no longer, I mean, I, I will never be recognized because I, I, I are the ordinary people. And some of them are the people I've met. Some of them, you know, sometimes when you do human rights, you meet with people and you say, what you're doing is dangerous, are you sure? And people say, this is my country, this is my destiny, this is my family, I know what I'm doing. You know, and I don't care about the risk. These are the real heroes. But also there are people who can make a difference. I've had, you know, the chance of working with, uh, with Ina Gilani, I've had the chance of working with, uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello. I've had the opportunity to work with uh, William Leslie Swing, Bill Swing for many. And I can tell you, there are people who really, really believe in what they do. There are people who are approachable. The beauty, and you see what is the, the characteristics of these people. These are people with whom I've shared hours and I've shared field situations or whatever. These are the people who recognize the same dignity to the person who was, whose work was simply to be the driver or the cleaner as to the president. And that's where you see the difference. People believe in people. They make the difference. These are my heroes.